People from all over the world are, are gathering today at all, all different hours, all crazy hours. Some people got up this morning for sunrise services like, like, like Pastor John uh, over, over at Pierce Brothers. To How many people were there? A couple hundred? More than that. More than that. People get up at all different hours to celebrate this day, to celebrate the risen Christ all over the world. This morning, I, I watched services that took place in, in Jerusalem. I, I watched services that took place in Spain. I, I read about what happened at, at services in Sri Lanka. All over the world, people are gathering this morning to worship the risen Lord. Some will gather in, in sanctuaries, kind of like this. Some will gather at beaches. Some will gather in parks. Some of our services will, will look like this, that are choir-led. Others will be led by praise teams. Others won't have any instruments at all. All coming together to praise the risen Lord. Some of those services last an hour. Some of them last three to four hours. I served a church in, in Malawi for a year. Easter Sunday was four hours long with three sermons. So John, Daryl, are you ready? <laughs> Don't worry, today will only be one, one hour. At some point during all of those services, there's a common thread. We'll do something like what, what we started our service with today where, where a pastor or a worship leader will stand up and say, he is risen and the congregation will respond, he is risen indeed. It's an appropriate response. We have reason to celebrate. Jesus conquered the grave, his tomb is empty, death has lost its sting, and we have been given hope. All because the tomb is empty, all because of the resurrection. It's good news that deserves an enthusiastic response with great friends, good music, Easter eggs, Easter bunnies, shouts of amen, all of those things. But the reality is the thrill of Easter doesn't exist in a vacuum. Celebrating this morning is appropriate, but it's not the only type of response we can have to the resurrection. Many of us will leave church this morning, and at some point, maybe after brunch, because we all like Easter brunch, we'll be overwhelmed this week. Or maybe we'll be afraid this week, because our lives have ups and downs, and we live in a, a crazy world. Or maybe the questions we've always had about who God is and, and how God works and about how we fit into the middle of it all will, will bubble up to the surface. For the next few moments this morning, I want to invite us to think about the other types of responses to Easter. Yes, we will celebrate and we should celebrate. But there are other types of responses as well. And I'm going to invite us this morning to spend some time reflecting on them. Will you please join me in prayer? Loving God, it is good to be here this morning. It is good to celebrate, to gather together, to sing songs of praise, and to allow your word to be proclaimed in and over our lives. God, as we reflect on the Easter story and the different sorts of responses to the resurrection, we ask that you would be with us. God, we ask that you'd give us ears to hear what you have for us, and I ask that you would take my words and use them for your glory. We pray these things in your name. Amen. So in the, in the church calendar, this, this last week, uh, it kind of goes something like this, Holy Week. Most of us know it, but you start with Palm Sunday. That was a week ago today. Then, then you have Monday, Thursday, which is the day that we, we kind of remember the Lord's Supper, it's when Jesus washes his disciples' feet. Then we get to, to Good Friday, when we remember the crucifixion, and then we get to Saturday. And when, when we get to Saturday, it, we, we kind of just pause. The, the story kind of stops for a minute. Some call it Silent Saturday. Others call it, call it Holy Saturday. And for pastors, it, it kind of becomes this, this, this odd day. And for the disciples, think about what they went through during that day. When the disciples waited for Jesus' grave, most of them sat in the same room where they had celebrated the Lord's Supper just a few days earlier. They weren't sure what to expect. They weren't sure what was coming. They had to be overwhelmed by what had just had taken place. They had to be afraid, not sure of what the, the Roman authorities who had just crucified their friend would do to them. 
They had to have plenty of questions. What did this mean? Jesus talked about God's kingdom coming and now Jesus was gone. What, what does this mean? They had to be overwhelmed. They had to be afraid. They had to have questions. So today, most pastors, when they, when they get to this place between Good Friday and Easter Sunday, we, we, we kind of pause and we say, huh, what do we do? Some spend it in prayer. Some spend it in prayer, reflecting on what just happened and preparing for Easter Sunday. Some spend it with their families. And some spend it completely rewriting their Easter Sunday message. Five years ago, that, that was me. My wife Haley uh, had a photography job in San Diego. We were living in Orange County at the time, and she got in the car with our, our daughter, who was almost two, she's now almost seven, Ella, uh, and, and dropped her off at her cousin's house while she went to work um, to take some pictures. And I, I had this nice, quiet day to myself. I went on a bike ride. I, I, I did some things around the house. And then I opened my computer and, and looked at what I had prepared for the Easter sunrise service the next morning. After reading it, I said, oh, that's terrible. And I deleted it, and I started over. Later that evening, Haley picked up my daughter from her cousin's house and started driving home. And at some point, after working a while, I took a break from my computer. I usually leave my phone in another room while I'm, I'm, I'm working on a sermon. And I, and I went and picked up my phone and realized I had missed eight or nine phone calls from, from random numbers that, that my phone didn't, didn't know. And at some point, my, my mom called, and, and she said, Haley and Ella are okay, but they've been in a car accident. They're on their way to the hospital, and that's just for precautionary reasons. Don't, don't worry. Your dad is on the way to meet them. At that point, it didn't really register with me. I just figured, oh, it's a fender bender. It's just a fender bender. And I, w I went back and, and worked on my sermon for a couple more hours. It wasn't until I talked to Haley a, a couple hours later that night that, that I heard the whole story. She was driving in the, in the carpool lane and, and, and was distracted for a minute and, and hit the center divide and then overreacted and turned and flipped the car multiple times. Somehow, both Haley and Ella walked away with just a, a few bruises and a few scratches. And I will never complain about car seat laws again. Needless to say, that Easter, my, my whole family was a bit overwhelmed, a, a bit afraid, and a bit shaken with questions about what, what could have happened. And over the last few years, when this weekend comes, when Easter weekend hits, I have this, this kind of mix of emotions. Yeah, I want to celebrate. And we should celebrate. I'm thankful to celebrate. But there's also something else there underneath the service as well. Joy is paired with a different sort of response. In the Easter story, in the passage that we read earlier and what we're about to read, but in what we just read, we heard that, that Mary... Mary runs to get Peter and John to tell them that Jesus' tomb was empty. And in John's gospel, he's quick to, to say that, you know, Peter may have ran faster, but, but John actually had the guts to go in to the tomb. And the three of them are understandably baffled by, by everything that had just happened. John steps into the tomb, saw Jesus' burial linen, linens on the ground, and he believed. But it's not until later it's not until later that, that anyone had the opportunity to stand face to face with the risen Lord. The first person who had that experience was Mary. Peter and John, they, they run to tell the other disciples. And, and, and as they're on their way, we, we read that Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting there where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. So, so Peter and John, they run to tell the others, but Mary is left there. And she thinks, I have to do something. I, I have to do something. But, but like anybody who is, is grieving, sometimes when we're grieving in the morning, the best we can do is, is put one foot in front of the other. And that's what she does. She, she just says, I've got to do something. So she turns 
and she looks into the tomb, not really sure what she's going to find. And when she finds the angels, they say to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. This question that they ask, it's not an interrogation. It's, it's, not, it's not a critical question, why are you crying? It's the sort of question that a friend asks someone who's grieving. Why, why are you weeping? Why, why are you crying? That they're seeking to comfort her. Now I have to imagine that, that Mary spent the Sabbath before Easter overwhelmed by everything she had just experienced. Remember, she was the one who was at Jesus' side, by Jesus' feet during the crucifixion. She, she witnessed everything. And now, on top of witnessing all that she witnessed, someone had stolen her friend's body. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know what it, that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Same sort of question, comforting question. Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Mary is so overwhelmed, so overcome with grief, that she doesn't recognize Jesus standing right in front of her. And he responds to her feeling of being overwhelmed by calling her name. When the risen Christ speaks her name, it's as, as if a fog is, is lifted from her and she, she physically turns toward him and she sees him. It's at that moment that we see grief turn to joy, that we see death become life. And like a little girl running to the teacher that she hasn't seen in a while, she cries out, Rabboni. Some of us here this morning, we're here to celebrate because it's Easter and that's what we do, but some of us sit in the same place where Mary sat outside the grave. We're simply overwhelmed. We feel the weight of the world resting on our shoulders and we're not sure what to do about it. Maybe it's something going on in your family, maybe it's something going on with a friend, or maybe it's just something you're wrestling with personally. And you just kinda wanna throw your hands up in the air and scream. Jesus responds to Mary, to her sense of, of being overwhelmed by calling her name. If you're overwhelmed this morning, maybe you need to just pause like Mary did at the mouth of the tomb and listen. You might not literally hear your name in the way that, that Mary did, but sometimes, instead of pausing to listen to what God might have for us in the midst of that feeling of being overwhelmed, we work ourselves up trying to deal with whatever it is that we're going through on our own. Earlier, when, when Jesus was walking with the disciples, he, he pauses and he, he, he stops and talks with some Pharisees. And as they're, they're, they're talking, he tells the story of a, a good shepherd. And he says, you know, in the morning, the good shepherd, he, he opens the gate and the sheep run out. But at night, the good shepherd goes back to the gate and he says, hey, come back. And the sheep come back because they recognize his voice. Because they know the shepherd's voice. If you're overwhelmed this Easter, I'd encourage you to pause and to spend some time listening for that voice. John continues, when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were, were locked for fears of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and, and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sin of any, they are retained. The disciples, they're, they're hiding away, remember, in that, that same house that they were in earlier, and they're hiding because they're, they're afraid. And, and their fear is perfectly sensible. Earlier, Jesus told them that, you know, if the world hates me, it's gonna hate you as well. And, and they know what just happened to Jesus, and they said, well, that must mean we're next. 
As they hide behind the walls and and the locked door, Jesus shows up in the middle of their safe place, in the middle of their sanctuary, and gives them a familiar greeting. Shalom alechem. Peace be with you. But Jesus doesn't just stand in the middle of their safe place. He also stands in the middle of their fear. His greeting was one that they had heard plenty of times. It was common, as as Julie shared earlier. And the fact that it was familiar, it would have kind of eased some of the tension that they were feeling. But these words had a different meaning now. That Hebrew phrase, shalom alakem, means wholeness, complete faith, complete blessing, full forgiveness, be yours. In two words, Jesus calms their fears. Jesus forgives them for for hiding away. But he also calls them into action. Peace be with you, he says a second time, and follows it up with, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Jesus responds to their fear by, by first offering peace, but he also invites them to step out and to engage their fear. You can't stay indoors forever. He invites them to leave the security of the house and to continue the work that he began. And then he invites them to receive the Holy Spirit. Some of us here this morning, we we sit in the same place that the disciples did that day. For whatever reason, we're, we're full of fear. We're afraid. Maybe it's over uncertainty of the future. Maybe it's over the dangers of our world. Or maybe it's the thoughts that that kind of swirl around in our own heads. So much of our world today is paralyzed by fear. And often for good good reason. I'm not here to tell you what what fears are legitimate and what what fears aren't legitimate. but, But we do need to know that Jesus responds to our fears by inviting us to experience peace. In the same way that he invites the disciples to step out of the house, to be sent into the world, to engage their fears, we're invited to engage ours. Knowing that the peace of Christ goes with us and that the peace of Christ goes before us. The peace of Christ is with us through whatever challenges we face. We're told that that one of the 12 disciples wasn't there in that, that room that first time. And we're not really sure where Thomas was, but we know that that he doubts the stories that the disciples share with him. He's full of questions. He's full of questions, and he wants those questions answered before he's willing to believe. A week later, his disciples were again in that house, and this time Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. There it is again. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Now, do do we read in this passage that Thomas actually reaches out and touches Jesus? This is the response part. No. (laughs) No. No. But Jesus invites him to search. Jesus invites him to question, to do some digging. When I was in in seminary, I I used to commute um, from San Diego to Pasadena, and and I drive with a guy who's now uh, is ordained in the Anglican Church, and, and we would have these intense conversations. We would have these intense conversations about what we we had just talked about in theology classes and in in New Testament classes and in Old Testament classes. We'd have these these intense conversations for two hours. Doesn't that sound like a ride you'd want to be in on? (laughs) And so we'd have these these great conversations and then I'd drop Mike off or Mike would drop me off and and, and, and we'd say, huh, I guess we don't know. I I guess we haven't answered the question. I guess God's God and we're not and we're going to have to be okay with that. We can't know all the answers. But Thomas' response to the resurrected Christ and Jesus' invitation to place his hand in his side reminds us that it is okay to ask questions. Jesus is risen. 
And we should respond in the celebratory way that many of us are responding today. We should have massive parties. We should have great brunch. We should, we should eat all the Easter chocolate, Cadbury for me, <laughs> that you want. But our response doesn't have to stop there. Easter reminds us that whether we're overwhelmed, whether we're afraid, or, or whether we have questions, that God meets us in the person of Jesus right where we sit. That the celebration response, that's, that's wonderful, but other responses are allowed as well. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for sending your son Jesus into this world to show us how much we are loved. As we celebrate the resurrected Christ, God, we ask that you would be with us. And as we have other types of responses to the resurrection and the empty tomb, remind us that you are in those places as well. God, we pray all these things in your name. Amen.